Sleep affects every organ system, every disease state. Literally everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. When you look at it from a medical standpoint, here's an example that's always fascinating to me. Cancer cells multiply faster the more sleep deprived you are. Welcome to the Betty Rocker Show, the place to be to nourish your mind, love your body, and rock your life. What's up, rock stars? Welcome back. It is great to have you here for today's show with Dr. Michael Bruce, aka America's Sleep Doctor. Dr. Bruce is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was recently named the top sleep specialist in California by Reader's Digest and one of the top 10 most influential people in sleep. Dr. Bruce is on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz show and has been on the show 40 times. You may have seen him there or on CNN, Oprah, The Doctors, or any number of TV shows, or heard of his best-selling book, The Power of When. He's the go-to sleep expert that the experts turn to. And I have lots of questions for him today that I think you'll find super interesting. So join me in welcoming him to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Well, we bonded first over our love of French Bulldogs because I know you have Hugo. So adorable. (laughs) (laughs) Is he gracing us with his presence in the office today? Absolutely. Let's, Let's get Hugo in the picture. Oh, Hugo. Oh, it there is he him. is. Oh, he's such, for those of you who are listening in, Hugo is a little black, sweet, adorable French bulldog with bright <laughs> eyes and just such a sweet little temperament. You can tell that he's got, that can tell that Hugo gets really good sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hugo is arguably the best sleeper in the house. And that's something that's really funny and something I've been started thinking a lot about lately. It's just sort of like the Tao of dogs and, and animals in general, of like how wise they are. Like Bodie and Ryder, like they're passed out by 9 30, 10 o'clock. And if I would just follow their sleep patterns, like all would be well for me. In my life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you know, they they naturally want to lay out in the sun, get that extra sunshine. They want to ground down through their feet in the grass. They're they're eating at regular meal times. I mean, what, there's some wisdom there that we should, <laughs> we should just listen. I think you're onto something here, Bree. I mean, holy cow. I mean, if we just all acted like Hugo and Bodhi and Ryder, I think we'd be in great shape. I, I do too. And, and I'm so glad that you're here to answer some of my burning questions. And also, I've had my, my listeners and my readers send me some questions about sleep. So I hope that you don't mind answering some of our, some of our many questions since you are so wise when it comes to all this stuff. But I I just wanted to ask you kind of a personal question to start out, which is how did sleep become the thing that you became the most interested in? I've really been curious about that. It was completely by accident. So I originally wanted to be a sports psychologist. I wanted to work with athletes and help them throw harder and run faster and all these kind of big things. What I did was I looked at uh, different programs. So I was studying at the University of Georgia. And while at the University of Georgia, they have an amazing sports psychology program. So I, was, I did that in, in conjunction with clinical psychology, but you do a residency. And the best residency in the country of all places was at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in, in Jackson, Mississippi. I was interested in athletes and eating disorders, kind of combining my two interests. But to be honest with you, I couldn't get in the program. The Harvards and the Yales and the Princeton people went there. And look, Georgia's top 20 program, but it wasn't Harvard, right? And however, they had a sleep track, a position there that they were offering for people for sleep. And I had worked my way through graduate school in the electrophysiology department. I like to take apart machines and put them back together that like have signals that come from the body. And I'm kind of a weird geek type of person like that. And so I, I said, well, the sleep machines are the same machines that I was working on. So I sold myself telling them that I knew how to operate all those machines and I would be a perfect pick for them. Because my thought process was, just because you tell me I'm not in your program doesn't mean that I'm not going to be in your program. And so I figured I would go and then just transfer. So I figured I'd sell myself as the sleep guy and then transfer. And so I got there and started my first rotation in the sleep lab. And by the third day, I absolutely fell in love with clinical sleep medicine. I knew that was where I was going to spend the rest of my life. Bree, I help people like this. It's unbelievable. You change somebody's sleep and you change their life. Like it's just 
I could not agree more. I love this story too. I love, I love how persistent you were. And it was almost like you were being led to this, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's really cool. Like, you know, hearing you talk about like what a geek you are and how you nerd out over that, you know, I want the person who really nerds out over science and this stuff to be the one telling me how my brain works and how my sleep cycle works. So thank you for caring about all of these, these deep, deep topics. It's, uh, it's fun stuff. It and, is. And, and it's helpful, which is even better. So that's, the, that, that's what I've been really trying to concentrate on. Because a lot of academic research, it's like, hey, there was this one study that said this one thing. I'm a clinician, right? So I work with people. And so I like to take that research and I like to apply it into clinical settings and into real world situations and see how it fares. Because, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, and some great researchers, don't get me wrong. I mean, people who've got some amazing books and, and really interesting information about sleep, but if you haven't tried to apply it into the patient setting or you haven't tried to apply it in your own life in a particular way, it's, it's not as rich of a piece of information. And I, I feel like it might not be as healthy. That, that's more of a fact in my mind versus like a tip or a help or, you know, a trick or something that I can apply. How does this affect me? And also how do all these pieces interweave to become something meaningful that we can put into our lives and, and use day to day and actually make a difference? Yeah. What's cool about my subject matter expert uh, area is everybody has to do what I'm an expert in. Like if you're a living creature, you're going to sleep at some point in time, you know, and that's kind of my wheelhouse, you know, whereas there are people who like, I know, you know, one of your areas of expertise is movement and nutrition. Well, there are people who can, you know, never move, right? I mean, there are people who just say, I'm not, that's not my thing, which is of course, incredibly unhealthy and all that. But you can't not sleep. <laughs> you you can can't, try. yeah. And you can't out train not sleeping. You can't out eat not sleeping. And this is, you know, you and I have talked before about my four pillars of health and yes. it's just a very simplistic way to talk about the healthy physique chair that we all sit on having four legs, but I actually order them in a very particular order based on what the most important pillar is, which is sleep. It's at the top, followed by nutrition, stress management, and exercise. And of course, there are other facets and components that come into our healthy life. But these four areas are so crucial to living a long, healthy life and a body that you love and, and being healthy. I feel like, but sleep, is, it's, at the, it's at the top. So have you ever struggled with, with your own sleep? So, you know, I get asked that question quite often. I, I've never had problems sleeping. I didn't get into it because of it. It was really more of a fascination with yeah. the data and just the feel. Now, to be fair, I don't have perfect sleep either. I mean, you met my son before we started. And if something's going on with him and something's stressful, I'm not sleeping too well. Yeah. Um, going on with my daughter or one of our dogs, I'm not sleeping too well. Like, those are inherent situations that would affect anybody, right? Right. The stress, stress is going to affect our sleep and and vice versa. And I I, I just wanted to ask because you you are a parent and I get so many parents that ask me about, well, how do I make my sleep better when I have kids, you know? And so you've mentioned that you've never had trouble sleeping, but I, I wonder if you think back to when your kids were little, did you ever struggle around that and how did you deal with it? So I never had trouble sleeping. I had trouble getting enough sleep. Yes. Um, there's a difference there. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Right? So I'll, I'll tell you the story. So when my daughter was born, which is our second child, and we had them 18 months apart, my wife said, hey, go to the fridge and grab the breast milk because she was pumped and had breast milk in there. I went to the linen closet and I opened up the linen closet and I yelled, Lauren, there's no milk in here. There's only towels. <laughs> Like, that's how tired I was. Okay. So everybody experiences it. And, and it's tough for parents out there. I totally get it. And we had two colicky babies. So we had two babies with gastroesophageal reflux, compounded prilosec. Like it was, there was a lot going on. They're fine now. But when you have a child who has special needs or any child, you know, this is this little creature that just basically shows up one day. And by the way, you're responsible for everything. And so not only is time management become a, a real issue, but stress does as, as well. And your nutrition. I can't count the number of new parents who are just grabbing whatever they can to shove in their mouth and they're not thoughtfully thinking, hey, this is going to affect my energy, my health, my happiness while I'm affecting this child. So like your pillars, your four pillars of health are perfect for new moms and new dads because if they can maintain that during that kind of a situation, dude, they're going to rock it. You know, when you're sleep deprived, 
there is an actual mechanism in your brain that makes it harder for you to actually reach for the right food too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know in your book, The Sleep Doctor's Diet, I think you talk quite a bit about this. Yeah. So, so what's so fascinating is the more sleep deprived we get, our body has very interesting reactions to it. So there's actually four things that happen to our body when we become sleep deprived. This is a great example of using new moms and dads as a situation where sleep deprivation can come in. But to be clear, this could be sleep deprivation from sleep apnea. It could be just regular work stress. It doesn't necessarily have to be new mom, new dad. So everybody can listen and, and, and apply the the knowledge. But here's what we know is four different things happen on a hormonal level when we're sleep deprived. So first thing that happens is during that moment of sleep deprivation, and by the way, sleep deprivation is different for everybody, right? So it's not always necessarily hours, but it could be quality of sleep as well. I've got some patients, they get eight hours, but they're still sleep deprived. So again, think about your own definition of sleep deprivation, but here's what happens on the biological levels. The first thing is your metabolism slows down. So you might be wondering, well, why does it slow down? Well, it's trying to conserve resources because you're awake and your brain doesn't know why you're awake because it thinks you should be asleep. So your metabolism is saying, okay, we need to slow down because we only have so much fuel in the tank, right? So we need to slow down our metabolism. So that's the first thing. Second thing that happens is cortisol elevates, which elevates your appetite. So why does it do that? Looking for more resources, right? So your brain is awake saying, holy crap, I'm awake. I've only got a quarter of a tank left. I'm going to slow down my metabolism, but I'm going to go look for something to eat. Mm. So that, so we have slow metabolism and high appetite, but it gets much worse. So then you have these two hormones. One is called leptin and the other is called ghrelin. So ghrelin, I call it the go hormone because ghrelin starts with G and go starts with G. And that's how I remember things. I like that. Thank you for that little reminder. We talk a lot about ghrelin and leptin and I like that reminder. Yeah, so it's the go hormone. Good it's trick. the hormone that your body makes you hungry. Now, remember, there's actually a difference in your brain between appetite and hunger. Those are actually two different things. So ghrelin increases by approximately 20%. So you have high appetite and high hunger, again, low metabolism. And then leptin does something else. Leptin is the, is the hormone that tells you that you're full. And so leptin lowers. So you feel less full, you feel more hungry, higher appetite, and lower metabolism. I mean, seriously, like, could it's it like get any It's like a cocktail worse? for like, let's, let's just pack let's on the pound. Right? Yeah. But here's the last factor, which makes it all the worse, is because your levels of cortisol are so high, your brain doesn't like it to have high levels of cortisol. So it wants to secrete something called serotonin to calm your brain down. The easiest way to secrete serotonin is to eat high fat, high carbohydrate foods. Oh, of course. Right. This is why we call them comfort foods. It's because they right. make us feel comfortable. They actually produce serotonin, which is that calming, relaxing, feel-good hormone. So the reason it feels good to eat a donut or a Snickers or a pint of ice cream is because the serotonin comes on board. You're sleep deprived. You've got this high level of cortisol. I mean, come on, it's a disaster. It's a total recipe for disaster, total <laughs> cocktail for disaster. And so I think that when you're, when you know going in, okay, I'm going to be sleep deprived. I've right. got kids. Right. I recently heard a great sort of strategy, and this is for, you know, two parent households where Ben Greenfield was actually talking about this on, on his, one of his episodes, he was talking about how, you know, alternate, I, I love him too. He's so, so smart. He was talking about how alternating shifts, like alternating nights so that each parent got a chance to get a full night's rest instead of trying to do it. Both of you do it taking turns in the night. Yeah. So, so that's called the on-call method. So I actually taught that to him. Of course, full circle. <laughs> Great so, people connecting. Yeah, so because I, I love, I do, I've been on his podcast and his blog. He's, he, he does a great job of doing really good research. When we're looking at parents and we've got two parent households, it's just like being on call if there's a middle of the night scenario, right? So I'm doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Your partner's doing Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You flip a coin or every other Sunday. That way, you know, if there's an issue in the middle of the night where a child needs whatever, it, it might be your turn or it might not be your turn. That level of stress, knowing that it's not your turn and that you can keep your eyes closed and stay in bed is worth every bit of gold you would ever have in your bank account. So I tell people to do that. And then there's a second way you can do that as well, which is you can have different time zones, right? So as an example, I've become over the course of time, I'm starting to become earlier and earlier in my wake ups, but my wife is later and later. And so we could split the night as an example, right? Because if, if you've got one person that's a night owl, they, they take until, let's say, two o'clock in the morning. And then a person who's an early bird takes from three o'clock in the morning on, all of a sudden, now you've got the night covered. 
that actually brings me to another question I have for you about the chronotypes, because you really pioneered that whole, I mean, it's, we're not just night owls and early birds. There are actually other yep. chronotypes that you've identified. You have a great quiz that I, I've taken. My brother's taken it. Everyone I know has taken it. We love your quiz. And we're all different animals in this right. chronotype. Can you explain that? And, and what does it mean? And how much sleep do we all need? And Yeah, of course. Getting right into it. So chronotype. So people may not have heard the word chronotype before, but they probably have heard of being an early bird or a night owl, right? And so my uh, contribution to the literature has been is, is the, since the 1970s, we've known that there are early birds and night owls. Then in like the 90s, 2000s, we discovered that there's, there's somebody in between that they used to call them a hummingbird. I wasn't particularly fond of that vernacular, but it, whatever. But what I felt like was that they were leaving out people with insomnia. So these are genetically predetermined set points in our bodies for our circadian rhythms. And if you look at the genetics, like if you did 23andMe and you sent it to me, I can show you exactly what you are because it's mm. in the type of thing. So this is deep in our genetics. So you take the quiz and you fall into one of four categories. Once you make it to a category, it's cool because I then know and you then know exactly what your hormone profile is. Here's where it gets interesting. So let's say, are you an early bird or a night owl? I am actually in real life an early bird, but okay. I trained myself to be a night owl from working a late night shift for most of my 20s and 30s. Got it. So, so you're, let's say you're an early bird, just to make the example, and let's say that I'm the night owl. If you wake up at 6.30, your melatonin faucet naturally turns off at 6.30. But if I wake up at 6.30, my melatonin faucet doesn't turn off until 8.30. That's why night owls hate morning so much is because our hormones are off. They're very, very predictable, right? So here's what's cool is you wake up at 6.30, let's say your uh, melatonin faucet turns off, then all of your hormones go on a very predictable pattern for the next 24 hours. And can you break down the pattern of our hormones for, for everyone? Because I think that would be super helpful. I, I love that sort of arc that they go through in a 24 yeah, so hour period. It's very, very interesting. And so as an example, the hormone that I've studied the most, of course, is, is melatonin because it's the sleep hormone. Yeah. Um, so I'll use that as an example. The sleep hormone follows your core body temperature pathway uh, very easily. So what happens is, is, for example, your temperature goes up, 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 up until about 1030 at night. It hits a peak and then it begins to crash. And when it crashes, that's a signal to the brain to release melatonin. It goes low, 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 low until about three o'clock in the morning, and then it kicks back up again. By the way, this is one of the reasons why so many people wake up at three o'clock in the morning is because there's this change, this circadian shift in your temperature and your body's getting warmer. And of course, it's easier to sleep in the cool than it is in the warm. Then it goes up, up, up until about 6.30, and then it gets warm enough where melatonin turns off and you naturally wake up. And so that's one example of, for example, a hormonal cycle, but it has an arc and then a fall and then an arc again. It's very, very predictable. The same holds true with cortisol, right. with estrogen, with testosterone, with progesterone, with all of these things. They all have their arcs and valleys, right? So here's what's cool about the book is once you know, and those are all shifted. So early birds, all that stuff happens starting at 6.30. Night owls, all that stuff starts happening at 8.30. So there's a difference. Right. And that's where it gets interesting. And it's so cool. And it's also like so probably gratifying for people who've tried to explain their whole lives, like why they're just on a different they, they right. you know, my cousin's a great example. He's a total night owl. And even, you know, I, he's not I don't think he's a what are, what are the four animals? So lion is an early bird. Yep. Bear is in between. Wolf is a night owl and dolphin is an insomniac. And it actually those animals all actually have that circadian rhythm. So lions are early morning creatures, wolves are nocturnal. That kind of I just love that you mapped them to the actual animals rhythms. And it made so much sense when I read the book. I loved it. I'm a, I'm the in between. I'm the bear. You're the bear. Bears yeah. are the best. <laughs> of course we are. But so is my, so he's not the, the insomniac. He's actually, I think the, is it, it's not the lion. It's the wolf. It's the, he's a wolf. Yeah. So he's a wolf and all his life people would, you know, give him a hard time for, yeah. you know, go to bed early or go to bed, but it's just not natural to him at all. And yeah. this is, and, and what I found was once I stopped behaving like a wolf and actually started behaving like a bear, I mean, like I'm a rehabbing bear right now, right. you know, <laughs> which exactly. is, that's really important. And I'm getting better quality of sleep and that's really what it kind of comes down to. And that's why I called the book, the power of when. 
because yeah. it's when do you do things? And it's not just a book about sleep. I teach you the best time to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise. Like when your hormones are at a naturally certain point, it's, it, you should take advantage of that. I love able, that. You know, just utilize that as opposed to I'm going to put this drug in my body to make me do this. There's po- points in time in everybody's 24 hour cycle where their body is naturally ready to do things like right. read email versus movement versus eat those types of things. And so those are, I'm trying to get people to start to understand the natural rhythm of their body because at the end of the day, you can't fight mother nature, right? I mean, it just doesn't work. <laughs> no. And you, you want to make friends with your body. I think that's something that I, I teach that constantly because I find so many of us are at odds with ourselves and we're, we're sort of like, we're really hard on ourselves because you know, I'm not losing weight fast enough. I'm not going to bed early enough. I'm not doing all these things. And when we actually get into the science and start to understand the mechanism of what our body's doing, even this right. as simple as like, how is our circadian rhythm affecting us? And is it that I'm actually a wolf when all this time I've been behaving like a dolphin and, you know, I just need to sort of like get back to my, to my better rhythm and optimize myself. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it is stressful. Like what are some of the, the side effects of, of not getting enough sleep? Yeah. So they're far and wide, right? So it affects, so sleep affects every organ system, every disease state, literally everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. When you look at it from a medical standpoint, here's an example that's always fascinating to me. Cancer cells multiply faster the more sleep deprived you are. Like drop the mic. At this exactly. <laughs> Cancer, right? Cancer. Like, come on. Like, do we have to have a bigger wake up call? Interestingly, with cancer in particular, we've now learned that if we administer chemotherapy at certain times within a circadian cycle, we use less chemo and it's more effective. Like less poison in the body and you get better just by understanding a circadian rhythm. I just like, need to have like an explosion sound right now because it's like, like mind blown, right? Like that's, uh, that's like, it sounds so intuitive to think that. Right? right, but it, until you point it out or talk about it, it's just overlooked. It's not yeah, obvious. And, and these techniques are now being used at some of the biggest cancer centers in the world. MD Anderson, uh, Sloan Kettering—they're starting to adopt these chemotherapy processes because the research is so strong. You know, and, and but not just medic on the medical side of things, the emotional side of things. Sleep deprivation has a huge effect. Uh, I have a 15-year-old daughter, and I, she put it best when she was 10. She was like, Dad, when people are sleepy, they're grumpy fish. And I was like, yes, that is exactly the word that I was looking for. Right? Yeah, and they're we just, have that, that word hangry, you know, for right. a reason. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, I think, from the emotional side of things, there's data to show that the more sleep deprived you are, the more negative you view things. So neutral stimuli are given to sleep deprived people and they rate the neutral stimulus negative. Like that's not good, guys. Like the whole outlook that you have when you're sleep deprived just isn't good. Here's another piece of information that I find fascinating is not only is your outlook uh, negative, but you send out a leave me alone vibe. So there's actually a study that looked at this and what they discovered was they took people who were sleep deprived and they took pictures of them and they asked people how friendly they seemed and how much they would want to go up and have a conversation with these people across the board. Nobody wanted to talk to these people who were sleep deprived because they knew, oh my gosh, look at them. They're exhausted. I either want to leave them alone or they're not going to be very nice to me. So it's not only just how we feel and when we get sleep deprived, but what is the intent, what is going out to the universe, what is going out to the people around us. Right, what right? are we projecting? Depending upon your, your, if you're spiritual, it absolutely has effect on your spirituality, right? So how can you, you know, practice whatever you want to practice when you're too tired? <laughs> it just doesn't work very well. It doesn't work. And, and also speaking of practices that we employ to improve the quality of our lives, how does sleep deprivation affect our ability to recover from exercise, for, to be able to exercise? Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So first of all, the single best way to improve the quality of your sleep is with exercise. Yay! Right? Single best, right? And that's why your information is so valuable. Like I've, I've been watching some of your videos and I love them because you're, you show people exactly what to do because you're the one who's doing it. You're not talking about it. You're doing it. And that's great for me because I have to see somebody, you know, doing it, but movement becomes an incredibly important part of our lives. And 
especially if you decide to become athletic. There's a difference between, hey, I'm going to park my car a little bit further away and walk to work versus I'm going to go run a 5K, right? There are differences. They're great. They're on the same spectrum, but there are differences. And so when you start to really physically exert yourself, you've got to give your body time to recover. The thing that always fascinates me, you know, sleep is healing, right? Like bottom line, sleep equals healing. So why on earth would you not want to let your body heal? Like that just boggles my mind. Like why do people say, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead? Well, that's going to happen a lot sooner than you might imagine. (laughs) It's this, it's this all or nothing mentality that we've sort of been um, indoctrinated with, unfortunately. And there are, I mean, I love social media, as you know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. I love using it, but there is this sort of undercurrent in the fitness space uh, on social media. That's much more prevalent these days of this no days off kind of attitude right. and like how strong can I be? Because of course my self-worth is tied to how much I exercise and how I look. And so I'm just going to go no days off all day long, every day and do multiple workouts. And just healing that psyche is so important and understanding the importance and the value of sleep and is, is why we're here to talk about this. So we give ourselves like not only permission, but an invitation and also to create a healthy sleep environment. So yeah. do you have some, some tips about how to make a healthy sleep environment, please yeah. share. I'm and delighted to hear. Friendly tips, to be clear. So if people have animals and they want to have their animals in their bed, I don't have a problem with that. We have two animals in our bed. We have a chihuahua and a French bulldog every night and a cat who wanders in as well. So what you have to do is you have to create the right sleep environment for you. Right? And, and so what I hate is when people say things like, turn off the television at eight o'clock, make your room pitch black, you know, don't have any alcohol, caffeine, blah, blah, blah. All of those things aren't necessarily terrible recommendations, but who's really going to listen to them? I I do. I mean, I don't eat ever. Like for, um, well, this is because you told me this um, in one of our, our really important conversations. And I, I, I get where you're going with this, but I also want to say thank you so much for reminding me to stop eating within a certain window of time before yes. bed. That's when I really stick to. I'm drinking decaf coffee right now. It's in the afternoon when we're recording this because I know that coffee has a half-life and I want to make sure I can get to sleep at my new time that I've determined is good for me. So, and I do, I did have to put curtains up in this house because there was too much light in my bedroom. Yep. They're not blackout blinds or anything extreme, but I did try to limit light. So Yes, I, I know we don't have to be so extreme, but these tips have really helped me and I got them from you. And I think you're just letting us off the hook and giving us easier ways to ease into it, which I appreciate about you so much. But these are good things too. Yeah. So when I look at a bedroom, I look at it from the five senses, right? So sight, Oh, I love you. Sound, this is so cool. Touch, taste, and smell, right? So you look at all five of the senses and you think, how can this be affecting me in my bedroom? I believe that sleep is a performance activity. So I'm a runner, right? And I can run a 5K with flip-flops and cutoffs and a torn t-shirt with a boom box on my arm, but my time's not going to be too good, right? But if I've got my Asics and my dry fit wear, you know, and my tunes going, like I can move, right? Because I perform better because I have the right equipment to run. The same idea holds true with sleep, right? So sight is light and you, you addressed it perfectly, right? So you go into a new environment and all of a sudden, hey, there's a lot of light in here. Well, remember, light turns off the melatonin faucet in your brain. So you don't want a lot of light. Now, do you want it to be pitch black? I'm going to argue, no, you don't. And here's why. It's great to have blackout curtains to fall asleep to, it's hell to try to wake up in a pitch black room. Right, right. Because that, the filter of that light coming through my non-blackout blinds, it, right. it alerts me to like, oh, it's, it's time to, to wake up. And now I actually get really confused on rainy days because it's yeah. darker for longer. Okay. And it makes me want to stay in bed a lot later. Exactly, exactly. So I like the idea of curtains or, you know, an eye mask, right? Mm-hmm. It's a sim- simple solution. And there's a ton of really cool eye masks out there for people to utilize. So sight should be light. And that should be the thing that you're, you're definitely thinking about. The yeah, next- I, I appreciate that. I just want to say that another thing, if you are waking up in the night, that's really helpful is of course, wearing something like your blue blockers and Absolutely. limiting limiting your exposure to light from your devices before bed is, is also really key. And I've been really helped by that as well. Yeah, so I forced my children to wear blue light blocking glasses. Hold on, I got some right here. I'll show you the ones because I actually created my own because I didn't like some of the ones that were out there. These are kind of goofy looking. I like them. I think they're kind of cool, right? So 
See? Oh, slick. Right? So th- what I like about these, first of all, I'm feeling very Bono, very uh, Nick Cage, very Elvis Costello wearing these. But the truth of the matter is, is they're blocking all this blue light. So I, had, I wanted to get my children because my children like to play on like Facebook and YouTube at, right before bed. And there's a lot of blue light that's coming from their devices and their computers. Well, it, I tried to eliminate that. So what I did, I was the mean dad. So I turned off the router one night in the house. Wow. Bold move. It was a bold move. Uh, Within 30 seconds, my son, my daughter, and my wife yelled, the internet's broken. What's going on? (laughs) (laughs) So I had everybody come downstairs and I handed everybody their own pair of blue light blocking glasses. And I said, look, if you can put these things on and you can wear them, I'll be happy to turn the router back on. And so everybody kind of agreed. And now my kids actually do like funny pictures and they post them on Instagram and Snapchat. They're like, look what my goofy sleep doctor father is making me do, but they wear them and they're able to fall asleep a lot easier. Right. And so so light is the opposite of sleep. So you want, you don't want a lot of light at night, but you definitely want a lot, a lot of light in the morning. So like one of my recommendations in the morning is first thing do grab a bottle of water. Second thing is walk over to the window and get some sunlight. Or right. better yet, walk outside, put your feet in the grass and... Even better, you feel grounded. There's a lot of data showing that people who put their feet on the earth within like a certain period of time of waking up actually feel a whole lot better. So like, I mean, of course, that, I mean, if you can, of course, put on, get out of your pajamas, right? Don't go outside and, you know, the buff or whatever. But other than that, I think you're probably, well, I guess it depends on where you live. But, uh, you know, other than that, I think you're probably much in, in pretty good shape for that. Next is sound. So it's all about what's going on sound-wise. Now, there's data, really interesting data looking at differences between genders for women and men and which sounds are more alerting at night. Oh my Um, gosh, I got to hear this. So it's it's quite fascinating. It's kind of what you would expect is women have a far greater tendency to hear crying babies and snoring than men do. Now, here's what was more interesting than that fact, because that seems kind of obvious. But when they interviewed the men and the women separately, what the men admitted to was that they heard the crying babies, but they wouldn't get up because they knew that their partner would get up. So they would fake sleep until their partner would get up. So for all of you women out there who are watching or listening, if you've got a crying baby, you can definitely throw an elbow and get your partner if you've got one to go help out because uh, they can still hear. They're just kind of faking it. That's your permission slip from Dr. Michael Bruce to you elbow go. your husband. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then there are also now we, we're discovering that there's music and sounds that can be actually helpful for people falling asleep. You know, historically, there's been uh, these things called binaural beats. Yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's one frequency in one ear, a higher or a lower frequency in the other ear. And the, and the idea here is that your brain tunes the two frequencies and helps change y- your brain waveforms. Now, that's the theory. To be fair, nobody's ever been able to do a great job of proving that that's actually what happens. However, many people find binaural beats to be incredibly relaxing. Um, And so I don't necessarily care if I don't know exactly why it's working, but I I like the idea that it's it's something that can be quite helpful. I, I love that. And I will say that when I lived in a, I live in more of a rural area now and I, I sleep, I sleep with layers of sound. I have a white noise machine that has multiple frequencies. I tend to like a sort of lower pitched hum and yeah. I sleep with earplugs pretty frequently. I always wear my sleep mask, but that's sufficient for where I live right now. In the past, when I've lived in a city and, or had loud neighbors, you know, I don't really blame my neighbors. They, they should be living their life doing what they do. I, I don't want to get frustrated. I just want to get a good night's sleep. So I would do different layers of sound machines. So I would set one sound machine to like a different frequency. I would run a fan and then I would set another sound machine to run a different frequency. And oh, that's awesome. it's similar to a binaural, I mean, probably not the same frequencies as binaural beats, no, exactly. but similar, similar concept. And it, I just did that instinctively because I noticed that the traffic had a certain sound to it. My neighbor's TV had a different pitch to it. And I just like was able to sort of muffle the sound and and get into like a really relaxed brain state and sleep well when that was the case. So just, and and, and I layered in the earplugs too, just, just for good measure. Well, so here's what's cool about your methodology. So first of all, you figured it out. So that's number one, which is awesome because most people don't actually play around with it enough to figure it out. So they're actually now we're starting to see this exact idea of yours encapsulated into products. 
So as an example, Bose this last year released these sleep buds. So these are ear, these are earbuds with noise cancellation uh, recordings inside the earbuds. They're wireless and you can sleep with them in your ear canals all night long. Wow. So cool. So it's kind of took your idea of the sound machine and the different things and then the earbuds and kind of put it all together. Maybe I can get some royalties from, uh, from Bose. Maybe I can. (laughs) I know you should talk to them, right? Uh, (laughs) Sorry. What are you right in the middle of? I'm right in the middle of uh, evaluating uh, the sleep buds. They just sent me some to take a look at to see if, the, if it's something that I would be willing to you know, talk about and, and kind of help them with. Are they commercially available now? They are. They yeah, are. Well, well, we'll put a link to those in the show notes along with all of um, Dr. Bruce's awesome books. And To be fair, I want to let you guys know that they're expensive. They're like 299 bucks. So before you go out and grab them, let me review them. Let me see if they're really worth it. Um, yeah, we'll we'll link to your review because by the time this episode airs, I'm sure we'll have wow. your review out. So I'm really excited to to share that with people. Thanks for mentioning yeah. it. And that actually reminds me, I know that we're going to talk about, we haven't covered all the senses, but I do have a quick question for you about shift workers because uh-huh. I get so many people who, who say, I mean, this, this is a fact of life. I mean, people who are not dolphins, people who are not wolves, people who are bears and lions right. are working night shifts out of necessity. And the nice thing would be like, you have an unsupportive spouse, leave your spouse. You have a job that has bad hours, leave your job. Like it's not always possible to do these things, right? We we have to find a better solution. So for for folks who are really struggling, Mm -hmm. I was thinking about those headphones as, you know, for when they are able to, the, the, the trick is to like get good quality sleep when you get sleep. And maybe you have some other tips, but I I think ways to cancel out the sound and really paying attention to these five senses to help yes. you get to sleep as fast as possible. Am I on the right track with that? Is that the best way to help a shift worker? Absolutely. So it's similar but different, right? And so with shift workers, the big thing is, is that they're having to sleep usually during the daytime and right. then be awake at night. So they're going to have their light, dark exposure is got to be opposite, right? right. And so they need lots of light at night and they need lots of dark during the day. So as an example, if you're a shift worker, then blackout curtains is a great idea right? Because you're going to be trying to sleep during the day when your room's going to be well lit. It's going to be very difficult to do. So that's an instance where a product might not work for somebody who's on a regular shift, but might work perfectly for somebody who's on the night shift, right? The other thing that's big for shift workers is the timing of your meals. Mm. So what most people don't know is you've got a circadian rhythm, right? Light, dark cycle that tells you when to go to bed and wake up. We've talked about chronotypes, but your metabolism has its own circadian rhythm. There are over 300 circadian rhythms in the body. And so if you keep your meal timing very consistent, your body knows what to do and when to do it. And that helps with this whole circadian flow. So when I talk to shift workers, a lot of them say things like, oh, well, you know, I I go to work at 11. And so I like to eat dinner with my family at six beforehand. That's a terrible idea, right? Because now you're eating five hours before you're about ready to go to work when that's probably time that you actually should be sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so hard from a lifestyle perspective because people want to, you know, connect with their families and and be together. But I think some of this information could help them, you know, educate themselves and their families about what is optimal for For them to do. Because I think you'd get a lot of support from your family if you're listening shift workers, if you were able to say, Hey, here's what would actually help me be more functional, be more rested, be more happy, all the things that we're talking about. Well, one of the best websites I've seen for shift workers, for resources for shift workers is called circadian.com. Oh, I've seen that in some of my research. Amazing. Yep. Thank you for reminding me of that. They are really, really good at putting out very easy to understand, good protocols that you can follow as a shift worker. So I recommend anybody to check out that website because I just think the guys Thank have got you. some really good clients. Great, re- great resource. Thank you so much. Okay, so where did we leave off with our five senses? Because we're only at sight and sound, we got to get to touch. Okay, let's hear it. So touch is mattress, pillow, sheets, temperature, all of that stuff. So is cooler better? Yes, yeah. cooler is better. Bottom line, you should. Sleep. I have a chili pad. Yay! There you go. So I love chili pad. That's one of the things. Oh, if people want to know, a chili pad it's kind of like it can get hot or cold. So during the summertime, it'll cool you down. And during the wintertime, it can warm you up. And the chili pad is so cool because you can also, you can, ha- you can get it with dual sides. So say yes. you've got someone who likes to sleep in it cooler, someone who likes to sleep in it warmer, you can, you can adjust the temperature on two sides of the bed to get, exactly. to get the optimal temperature for everyone. Awesome. Yeah. It's so awesome. And also for like, as an example, for menopausal women, like 
this is great for hot flashes. And of course, you know, depending upon what part of the country you're listening from, you're probably in the heat wave somewhere. You know, this is the time to really chill out and get cool. And then when we talk about the mattress and the pillow, you want to think of it as a sleep system. You don't want to think of them as separate things, right? And so as an example, if you're a side sleeper, right, then you're going to want to have a thick pillow because you need to make up for the space between your ear and your shoulder. So let's say this is the mattress. I got to make up for this space with the pillow so that my nose is in line with my sternum and I don't have any neck strain. Okay. Yeah, that, that vertebral alignment is crucial. That's like why the Tempur-Pedic like, contoured pillow, you buy it for the different sizes of the body. Like I have a small, you probably have a large, and right. it, it helps um, because the, the bump is, is higher up so that you're, when you're side sleeping, you're getting the correct contour. And also when you're back sleeping, you've got enough of a C-curve in your spine. Right. Exactly. And, so, and that's the thing that people have to realize is like, for example, if you get a rock hard firm bed, that might not be the best for you. So you may have to get in a pillow that adapt, like it might be great for your back, but not so great for your neck. So let's say as an example, you like a super firm bed because you've got low back pain. Well, that's fine. If you're a back sleeper, then you don't want a big thick pillow because it's going to pitch your head forward. That's right. You're not going to be able to breathe too well. So you want something that's going to allow your breathing to allow for be a little bit easier. So you'd want a th- very, very thin pillow. When I go to hotels, I often struggle with the, the thick pillows that yes. they have. So I take a rolled up towel, I take a towel from the bathroom, I roll it up and I put that under my neck. And that's right. kind of like how I, how I so sleep. I'm gonna, so I'm going to teach you the trick, right? So first of all, the reason that those pillows aren't so good is they're all overstuffed because right. they last longer, right? So in the hotel universe, it's just how long can we make the product last before we have to replace it? So they're all overstuffed. So number one, I, your, your towel idea is cool, but what I tell people to do is instead of using a washcloth, use the hand towel, not the bath towel, but like the hand towel. Yeah, that's roll, what I use as right, the hand towel. Roll it up so it's like, you know, it looks like a piece of bread or something, but then put it inside the pillow case at the bottom part of the pillow. Oh, it, so it, smart. It, give, it automatically gives you that neck support, but it also keeps your head uh, kind of uh, situated in one place. And so then you can get stability all night. You're such a smart guy, Dr. Bruce. I love that tip. Thanks for that. That's great. You know, like just being able to like make something work where you're at. It's like why I give you guys workouts you can do anywhere because you're traveling. You want to be able to keep moving, keep up your routine. You know, when your sleep is just as much a part of that. I love talking about the cold therapy, like the cold mattress. And like if we're exercising regularly, generating that systemic inflammation in our system from our workout and recovering from our workout, we need the cold can be like speed up how fast you're able to recover. I mean, turning down the temperature in your bedroom can be effective, but I love, I love my chili pad. I think it was a great investment. And I'm so glad that we talked about, about that. And also I I will share with you my sleep system. I didn't know to call it that until now, but I I will now. I have a Tempur-Pedic curved contoured a pillow that's inside of a satin pillowcase so that my hair stays nice because right. very important. <laughs> I have a Tempur-Pedic mattress topper on top of my firm mattress. I found that the full-on Tempur-Pedic mattresses were just too marshmallowy for me, even with the different gradients and also really expensive. And the, the topper was a really cost-effective way. And I, I just flip it over periodically to continue to be able to get use out of it. I've had it for 10 years. It's crazy. I just keep moving it around and just being paying really a lot of attention to like the quality of sheets and bedding that I use and the yes. weight of my duvet cover and duvet like filler, all of that stuff. And I sleep with two pillows, one on either side of me so that I can roll side to side. And it just really gives me a great night's sleep. And see, so again, you're the hacker, right? You're tweaking it. You're finding out the thing that works best for you. And that's exactly what we should have people do. So sheets now, they make moisture wicking sheets. Yep. So cool are really cool. I like the kind that where the moisture wicking comes from the weave of the sheet, not a chemical that's been placed on the sheet itself. So there are different ones out there. So kind of be a buyer beware. You want, you want the kind that the wick of the sweat comes from the actual weave of the sheet. Any um, brands you recommend? Because you're the first person who's ever mentioned that. And I think that is so cool. And thinking about like the dyes and the stuff that's like, you know, this is why we wash our sheets and we wash our plates when we buy them brand new, like to try to get some of that stuff off. But this right. is really cool. What, what are some companies? Uh, there was one, I, I don't know if they're still around. They were called Wild Blue, but blue was spelled like B-L-E-U, like the French way. So I think that was, that was certainly one of them. If you just go to Google and you type in moisture wicking sheets you, and just look for, because they'll all tell you how they do it. It all, it, you really want to look for, is, is it the weave or is it some 
substance that they've soaked the sheets in or something like that. Oh, it's so, so insightful. Thank you so much for that tip. Yeah. Love it. And you really want to have cotton. Like cotton is really the best material. It's the most breathable. It absorbs the most moisture. That's kind of what you're looking for. You should be changing your duvet its heaviness based on summer versus winter, right? So you should have a summer cover, cover or coverlet during the summer and then something thicker for the winter type of thing. Unless you live in Florida where it's always like freezing in your house from air conditioning and always hot outside. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, no, but that's so, a great point because seasonal sleeping is, is, is super yes. important. Yeah. And they also, by the way, make moisture wicking pajamas, not just moisture wicking sheets. So for people who are night sweaters or who are women who are going through menopause, or if you live in a warm environment, all of that can be super duper helpful. Again, just kind of thinking through these ideas. When you look around your room, you know, does it feel tranquil? Does it feel relaxing, right? If there are piles of laundry and your computer and work and things like that are all there, then, then no, it, it doesn't feel like that. And so that's one of the things that we want it to feel is we want it to feel tranquil because intent turns out to be incredibly important with sleep. And so when you walk into a bedroom, you should feel a, ah. Ah, oh, yes. Relaxing. Yeah, I, this is my chill spot. And, and whatever you choose to do there, whether it's intimacy versus reading a book versus sleeping, even watching television, if that's what you want to do, that's all okay as long as you do it in a, in a thoughtful way that's helpful towards sleep, right? And so, you know, kind of to round out, you know, we talked about sight, sound, touch. So we're going to skip to smell, uh, aromatherapy, right? And so there is data to show that lavender and vanilla are the two scents. There's a double-blind, placebo-controlled study to show that they help people sleep. Now, wow. to be clear, yeah, it's interesting. You don't just sniff something and pass out, right? Unless it's ether, right? Or something like that, right? What it does is it forms a relaxation response across the musculature. And so when you, remember, your, your sense of smell is the most primal sense you have. It goes straight to the limbic system. It's, it's like that alligator brain, like dinosaur brain from back in the day. And so when you affect it, you can make it do all kinds of different things. And so these two scents, well, there's three of them, actually. There's lavender. There's something called elang, elang, that's spelled Y-L-A-N-G. And then there's vanilla. These cause the musculature to relax, and then the natural sleep process can kind of take over. Awesome. Now, I, use, I use essential oils before sleep, actually. Yeah, exactly. And so, and there's different, and there's also different formats, right? So let's say you like one scent, but your partner doesn't. Well, then you can use a pillow mist where it's only, you just spray it only on your pillow, right? Versus them, because, you know, maybe somebody doesn't like the smell of lavender. Now, the other thing that we noticed um, in looking at this research is women in particular, it's interesting because um, many women don't wash their hair um, every day, right? They don't need to necessarily. And so what happens sometimes is if they spray the pillow mist and then they lie down, their hair smells like lavender all day. So just a forewarning. There are worse things than that. That's for sure. There absolutely are worse things than that. But instead of the pillow mist, what I've found has been helpful has been a sachet. Like, oh, you know, that's nice. Yeah. Things that you can just throw a couple of them in the pillow then you're only experiencing it and your hair doesn't smell. So again, it just depends upon sort of what you dig, what you're into and things like that. Sorry, I had to interject, but I was going to say I use sachets in my pajama drawer. I have, I wear light, you know, silk PJs to sleep in and I have sachets with lavender in my PJ drawer. And I actually didn't put that together. I just really like the scent and it's in my sleep aromatherapy oil. So duh, (laughs) that's awesome. That's good. And then the, the final one is taste, right? And so what does taste have to do this? Well, when you think about it and you start to look at it, you know, every every morsel that you put in your body affects your body, right? Sure. And so it's going to affect your sleep. So I talk with people a lot about snacks before bed, things of that nature. What what should you eat? What shouldn't you eat? You know, obviously you don't, you don't need a lot of sugar before bed. You don't want caffeine before bed. You really don't want alcohol before bed. You know, there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out, right? You know, like we want to avoid the passing out. Nothing wrong with a couple of glasses of wine at dinner. I'm here to tell you, just give yourself an hour for each glass, right? So let's say you start dinner at six or 6.30 and you're done by eight and you had two glasses of wine. Well, if you don't go to bed until 10, you're fine. It takes the average human one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage. However, remember, alcohol is a diuretic. So after you've had finished that glass of wine, drink a glass of water, right? So that way you stay hydrated. Because remember, sleep is a dehydrating process. We lose right. the leader, right? We were talking before. So you want to think that through just in terms of what are you doing and just be thoughtful and you'll be surprised at how much better you sleep. You kind of, I know we, we've talked about this together via email a little bit too, about the, the dehydration and, and staying hydrated before bed and that, 
it is the case that obviously you don't want to interrupt your sleep by waking up to use the bathroom constantly. So how do you kind of balance that out? How long should you wait to go to sleep after you've had drinks? And like, should you limit yourself or not? So what I tell people is you, if you can, you kind of want to stop drinking fluids about 90 minutes before bed. Yeah. So, right. If you're going to bed at 1130, if you can stop by about 10, you're probably in good shape. Now, to be fair, talk with your doctor, because if you're diabetic or there are yes. certain medications you have to take, or there are certain things that dehydrate you that you have to continue to, to take fluids up until that time, please do so. But as a general recommendation, 90 minutes or so of stopping fluids is usually the best place to, to do that. And just make sure you go to the bathroom before you go to bed. Right. Right. And you mentioned, you know, like uh, what we eat is so important. And, you know, you gave us a great tip for how long to give after each alcoholic beverage. But, you know, I, it was really, I, I just wondered if you would elaborate just slightly on meals before bed, because yeah. since we talked the first time, I've been really mindful of limiting my meals before bed by at least three hours because yep. I, I want to be able to get optimal sleep. And I'm an all or something person, so I don't get this perfectly every single night, but I do strive for it. It's my, it's my goal. So would you just explain why that is? Yeah. So, so when we look at, so your stomach has a circadian rhythm, like we were saying before. And so you want to have your meals at a very consistent time. So your body knows what to do to metabolize them. However, there's a problem is if you're going to do that, you're going to need about three to three and a half hours after, of going to sleep after you've finished your meal. Well, here's where that gets wonky. Depending on how much sleep you get, at about three o'clock in the morning, you could be out of fuel, right? And so this happens with people constantly is they wake up at three o'clock in the morning and it's actually a blood sugar issue. Mm -hmm. So they stopped eating at seven, it's three o'clock in the morning, that's literally eight hours, your body's out of fuel, what do you do? So there's a couple of different things that people can do. Number one, and I found this works in about 30, 35% of my cases, and it was totally bizarre to me, but a teaspoon of raw honey 30 minutes before bed. Oh, right? I love this tip. And, and if, especially if you're using something like um, Beekeepers Naturals, like propolis yes, I honey. I love their stuff. Love their stuff, awesome. Carly, that whole team. And the, and the propolis yeah. honey is really special, great for our immune system, yeah. has antibacterial properties for your gut. So that's a great tip. Thank you. Yeah. So 30 minutes before bed, a teaspoon, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon. A teaspoon, yeah. Um, and it's good because it's hard for your body to break it down. So it keeps your blood sugar stable all night long. And that if, and, But if you've got diabetes or you're keto or you're paleo and that's not your thing, guava leaf tea. Not Ooh. Guava, and not guava fruit, but guava leaf tea does the exact same thing. Wow, what a great tip that is. Well, thank you so much. My gosh, you've just covered the whole spectrum. And honestly, I could sit here and ask you questions for hours because you are a wealth of information, not only about sleep, but about the human body. And you just, you put so much time and care into treating people and taking care of people. And, and I thank you for your generosity and sharing all of this stuff with us today. Obviously, I'm going to put links to all the things we talked about and your website, but is there a special way that you want people to interact with your information? So people are welcome to check me out. I'm at www.thesleepdoctor.com. And if you want to learn what your chronotype is, if you go to chronoquiz.com, uh, you can learn all about your chronotype and you get this cool report that tells you what you are and a couple of different fun things to do and things like that. So Highly recommended, by the way. It's super cool. It's fun. It is. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for saying so. I so appreciate having Dr. Bruce on and I wanted to give you a sleep challenge this week to help you get better sleep and really make this a focus for yourself. So if you're someone who struggles to get to bed early enough, your challenge is to use your phone and set some timers to help you get to bed a little earlier than normal. The first timer is a get ready for bed timer. I want you to set this at least an hour before your ideal bedtime. I suggest you turn off the TV, put on your PJs and brush your teeth. Get in bed with a good book. Your second timer is a go to sleep timer. You may not need this timer, but it's recommended. You can leave yourself a nice message when this timer goes off that says, do this to wake up feeling great, or I love myself so I go to sleep on time. This double timer system really helped me because I needed a reminder to get ready for bed and wind down. If I didn't do this first timer, I would often just kind of idly keep an eye on the clock as I was staying up later and later, thinking I'd go to bed soon. And that soon just kept getting pushed back farther and farther. Now, if you don't have trouble with getting to bed on time, but you do struggle with restful sleep, here are some things I'd like you to check in your sleep environment and do to see if they help. 
So first and foremost, make sure you're not eating or exercising too close to bedtime. These activities should be wrapped up two to three hours before you're planning to sleep. I also recommend an evening meditation. You can use an app for this or a practice like Ziva meditation. You can also use a stress reducing supplement like my Serenicom or a sleep helpful supplement like Whole Sleep. To support your body in getting restful sleep, tune into your five senses when it comes to creating a good sleep environment. For instance, is it dark enough in your room? Consider an eye mask if not. Are you watching TV or using your phone right up until bedtime? Consider taking a break from these devices at least an hour before bed. And the option of wearing blue light blocking glasses in the evening when you're exposed to artificial light to really help your body cycle down and allow melatonin to rise so you can naturally fall asleep and get deeper sleep. Are there disruptive noises that are waking you up? Consider a sound machine or a loud fan to drown them out. Is your bedding and pajama material soothing and soft? Is your bed too hot or too cold? Consider a chili pad or a cooling or heating pad to adjust the temperature near your skin when you sleep. Consider bringing soothing smells like lavender into your room by either scenting your pillows or your pajamas or using a diffuser. And leave yourself time for wind down rituals like brushing your teeth or taking a shower or a bath. Reading before bed and leaving yourself time to do that is a great bedtime ritual to cultivate as well as journaling about your day, practicing your gratitudes. And these have all been really big helps to me personally. If you're curious about tracking your sleep data, I highly recommend the Aura Ring, that's spelled O-U-R-A, as it gives just fantastic data about the amount of REM sleep, deep sleep, and so much more. Plus, it tracks your daily steps, your daily activities, and it just contains some great tools to help you have a more balanced day in general, like meditations and calm moments. I've been using this tool for five years or more, I think, and it's, it's just given me so much insight and awareness of, of my sleep. So I really hope that some of these tips are helpful and that you take my sleep challenge and that you take a lot of what Dr. Bruce shared with us today to heart. And I invite you to grab links and written details from today's show for reference over on the show notes page, as always, at thebettyrocker.com forward slash podcast and leave me a comment or question if you have one. And coming up in our next episode, I'm talking to Trisha Nelson, an emotional eating expert and the author of the number one bestselling book, Heal Your Hunger. Seven Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now. Trisha herself lost 50 pounds by identifying and healing the underlying causes of her emotional eating and has spent over 30 years researching the hidden causes of the addictive personality. This is just a really great conversation that you won't want to miss. So until next time, I'm Betty Rocker and you are so awesome and amazing. Thanks for listening and I'll talk to you again real soon. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Brie Argett Singer, Betty Rocker Inc. and the producers disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. Before starting a new exercise, fitness or health protocol, or if you think you have a medical problem, always consult a licensed physician.